And we're live. Top of the morning, North Reach, or evening, or afternoon, whatever time of day you're watching this, top of that to you. And welcome back to The Chopping Block, the only Amp Guard podcast unaffected by time and space. As always, I'm your host, Harz, and with me is Ray. Hello. And our guest for today is the monarch of Icefire Bay. Welcome, Arian. Thanks for having me, guys. How's it going today, Arian? It's going pretty good. Sweet. Yeah, I'm kind of like at the end of a, a really, really long day, but it was amazing. Oh, yeah, you work the graveyard shift, don't you? Uh, yeah, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Yeesh, I do not envy you. <laughs> Well, it's pretty fun because I drive cab, and so I get to meet a lot of really incredible people. Well, that's cool. I thought about getting into Uber for similar reasons. Yeah, we here in Homer, we actually have some of the cheapest cabs in the nation, and uh, we have two pretty good companies. I, I like my company better than the other company, but maybe I'm just a little biased. That's fair. And and Uber did try down here like last fall, and they lasted like a week. Yeah, I think Alaska has both Uber and Lyft. I'm not sure. I think so. I keep getting emails from Lyft asking if I want to join in. Yeah, I think I've only used one, and I only use it when I'm going to like the kind of parties where I know I will not need to get, where I will probably need a driver going to or from. But yeah, it's it's something. Right on. And I hear in the bigger cities, using Uber is sometimes a cheaper way to go. And I've heard people have really good experiences. Typically, yeah. I mean. I mean, I know you said that your guys, uh, t- that Homer's taxi service is a lot cheaper compared to the rest, of the, r- the rest of the state. Up here, it's ridiculous. Well, yeah, in Kodiak, it's pretty crazy, too. Seriously? Huh. Oh, yeah, somebody was saying it's like 22 bucks to go a couple blocks. That's... wow. I mean, yeah. I guess... I guess limited supply and demand, huh? I, I guess something like that. You learn a lot of interesting things driving cab. Well, I will definitely cross cross cab services off my to-do list if I ever end up going to Kodiak. Sometimes it's good to just rent a car. Yeah. Well, anyway, I think now we, pro- we can probably start getting into some of these questions we got here because we got we didn't get a whole lot, but we got a pretty some that are pretty substantial. So, all right, let's go for it. Yeah, I was just pulling up the page. Um, so, our first question we got is from Richter, and he goes, Coming from a small shire, what are some of the difficulties you face keeping participation up? Well, uh, some of the difficulty is is that we kind of had a young group that inspired and started the shire down here. And so, I've actually talked to a rather large number of adults at this point who are interested in doing the... LARPing in the amp guard, but they feel like it's more of a kid thing, and I highly reassure them that there are people all over Alaska of all ages that are enjoying this event and that they can come and do it. So I'm not entirely sure if they're afraid of beating up kids or if they're afraid of getting their ass kicked by kids, but um, it's been kind of tough getting that older group coming in, and as our Shire members get older, well, they you know, those final years of high school and whatnot are, are rather time consuming. And so they don't quite have as much time to come out and, and play with us. So, um, that can definitely affect the numbers, uh, at different times of the year. That is true. But I mean, I'm, I imagine the numbers are good now. It is summer. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, we've had some, some pretty good numbers coming out. We had a good, really good turnout last quest. That's awesome. I've heard a lot of good stuff about your guys' questing, and I'm sad that I haven't been able to make it out yet. Yeah, there are a whole lot of them. I'm sorry I haven't been able to make it to quests in other parts as much. Well, don't feel too bad. I haven't been able to either. <laughs> I always enjoy the, the pictures, though, and I think it'd be kind of neat if we could find a scribe in each park so that they could like record the quests in a story-like manner so that the other parks could maybe read them and maybe get some ideas and get inspired. That'd be cool. I know um, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm gonna sort of embarrass him for a second here, but uh, Dan was telling me about about your guys' like uh, Eastern-influenced uh, questing event you had. Oh, yeah, yeah, we've had some really good Easter quests. Not Easter, like Eastern-inspired, like like when you were, when you were, when like everyone was becoming spirits and like your the final boss was like an Oni of some kind and you had to banish it by doing a certain routine. It, that sounded really cool, honestly. 
Oh, yeah. That one was a whole lot of fun, for sure. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of different members that are a lot of interested in different um, topics and areas, and we try to pull on those different expertise to add diff- extra flavor to our quests. I'm sure they appreciate it. I would appreciate it myself, but I haven't been able to see it yet, so I haven't been able to appreciate. But yeah. <laughs> well, we'll get you down here one of these days. Soon. I'm hoping soon. Um, well, I know one of Deli's questions was what the myth- mystical land of Icefar Bay is like, but I have a feeling that we're probably just going to so- slowly answer that over the course of this episode. <laughs> Sure. Um, I could talk about some of the, the main areas that we like to, to meet. Um, I mean, in the wintertime, we meet at, at CCC for battle games, and it definitely feels a lot smaller than using the park up at Karen Hornaday. Um, we really love doing quests up in the Karen Hornaday campground because it's just that the trees and the layout makes for all sorts of different pathways and stuff, and the campers always get a big kick out of uh, seeing us. Um, another place is down by the beach. We have this path from the Islands and Ocean Center down to the, the beach there, and the woods in there is an excellent spot that provides all sorts of different possibilities for, for various quests and um, capacities. And then we have another park out east end there that has uh, great treed areas and open areas and, like, you know, it's just three different main terrains, four really, um, that we can work with. Um, our, our land is, is a really fun one and it, it varies and changes depending on the mood. See, having been there a couple times, I've only been there when you guys were in, using your indoor site. So it's a little weird hearing, hearing you guys say that it's a, how small of a location it is. Cause compared to some of our indoor sites, it's actually pretty big from what I've seen. Well, I guess when I first started at Ampgard, it was in the summertime, and so we were outside, and we had the whole a whole baseball field to work with, and that's just way bigger than a gym, and you get much bigger of a workout. Um, and that's so, fair. Yeah, and then so having to go to the gym space, it was like whoa, and we did see a a little bit of a drop off when we moved indoors some because on some of the bigger days it just got crowded, you know. Okay, that's that's a fair comparison then. Yeah, the Kenai space definitely seems bigger than the gym space that we have to use, but I haven't been to many of the other indoor parks. I was going to say, it seems like gym spaces in general are, are pretty small. I think the biggest we played at was the dome for space in the winters. Yeah, the dome was pretty big, but it was also expensive. Okay. So, what are some of the positive experiences you've encountered as Monarch? Well, it's been a lot of fun getting to represent the Shire to the community when we're holding different events and, you know, get to tell them I'm the Monarch and uh, tell them a little bit about our park and stuff, you know, it it always makes them smile. And, um, you know, um, just getting to to talk to different parents and stuff, I feel like I've help give them a little confidence with having their kids out there like they are going to be safe and have a whole lot of fun um also it's it's been a lot of fun doing different announcements and just kind of getting to plan different events and things like that very cool what sort of events have you had the most fun planning just playing off that question uh, well, doing the masquerade ball that we do in the fall has been a whole lot of fun. We've uh, the first year that we did it, we were, one of our Shire members taught dance lessons to some of the members, so we learned the the two step and some basic salsa and swing dance moves. And so uh, then we had a great space for it, and we had a whole lot of fun. And I know that it's given those member Shire members that learn those dance moves a lot more confidence than in school dances and stuff like that. Um, so that's been a, a really fun one and doing our mid rains has always been a whole lot of fun because, you know, um, we try to inspire that potluck and get everybody involved with it. Um, uh, upcoming we have actually, we're going to be in the 4th of July parade. Um, we've been in a couple of parades down here in Homer and we've won awards each time, which has been pretty cool. but. The best part is, I I find that it's kind of neat to watch a parade, but it's way more fun to be in a parade. 
And uh, when we do it, we're fighting down the street and people get to see us in action and stuff. And it seems like it, it's kind of one of those uh, more fun parts of the parade. And uh, this year we've got a, uh, a truck that's going to be pulling a trailer that's holding a boat that we're going to tr transform into a Viking ship. And we're going to have people on the boat and people fighting alongside the boat. And um, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. That sounds so, awesome. Yeah, and we've also reserved the pavilion up at the Karen Day Park to do a uh, welcome barbecue after the parade. So people could go out there, enjoy some food, and, you know, try some sparring, check out the weapons, see kind of what we're about. That is amazing. <laughs> that sounds really cool. I know. I, I feel like we could, in all the other parks, learn a lot from your public involvement and the things that you guys do for events. That's really amazing. I swear Bay in general seems to be sort of a natural when it comes to public involvement because they also helped run our SenshiCon booth this year too. Yeah, that was a whole lot of fun for sure. And I really look forward to seeing what the booth is like this year. I'm not going to be running it this year, but I'm looking forward to hopefully helping out here and there sounds good all right well i guess that kind of i guess that kind of loops into this question here a little bit from this is the last richter question that it, that is if you plan to run for office again what goals do you have to see your part grow well i do plan to run for office again and um i mean that's before we do like the official elections anyway but um i'm looking at making up new posters and whatnot because a lot of people see our posters at the library there and it inspires people and it's nice having our ans event there at the library because it gets a lot of people interested um i'd like to maybe make a couple banners to put outside the door that we can just post up there that kind of gives a little more information so that you know because people are always seeing us in there having a lot of fun and i want to make them feel more welcome to come in and ask questions and be a part of it um so i didn't say anything because i thought you were still going well, uh, yeah, just just the moment of pause. Um, this this year around is going to be a little more difficult because our champion's going to be leaving. So um, it it may uh, energies might just be uh, a little more spread thin. Champion. So your champion is Chinoha, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, indeed, and he'll be going off to college in another place. Aww. Yeah, but now he can spread his magic in other places, and he'll be back. Uh, yeah, so I look at trying to encourage as much as I can. Um, be sure to put up Facebook page posts on uh, various sites about our different quests and stuff and inviting people in, because I know it was the, one of the first quests they ran here in uh, Icefire Bay that we saw in the newspaper that actually uh, I heard about, and it's the reason why I found out about it and joined in. That's awesome. Yeah, I had like three different people tell me about it. They're like, oh my gosh, I read this in the paper and I totally thought of you. I don't know. I personally would be flattered by that. Yeah, it was nice. And I'm really glad that I found it. And it would have been nice if we had this many years ago, but, you know, no need to look at back. We're just doing everything we can to make it something awesome now. Okay, so I guess the next question, speaking of Chi, is from Chi. So he says he heard Ice Fire Bay doesn't like politics and simply doesn't want to become a barony. Do you have any comments about this? <laughs> it looks like he was quoting somebody else too. He just doesn't say who. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and um, I guess to uh, let everybody know, it's kind of interesting being down here and being started with with such a young populace. Um, so most of our Shire members actually, once they get old enough to hold office, end up going away to college, Chinoha. Um, and so uh, if he hadn't gotten injured last summer, we wouldn't have had him this long. So it, that's, I'm glad he was here. So everything happens for a reason, right? Um, but anyway, um, so it's not that we don't want to become a barony. We would be happy to be a barony. We just only are, are struggling by with our top four as, a pot, as opposed to our top five. We meet all the other qualifications, but we don't have 
enough shy members that show up to regular meetings that are over 18 so can hold office. That's fair. You guys definitely have the youngest population that I've seen there consistently. <laughs> yeah, and they're fast and they really know what they're doing. Yeah, I honestly it's a little unnerving. Yeah, but they have a lot of fun with it and they get kind of flirty. <laughs> yeah, that's the important thing. It's all about having fun, right? Well, and I think that also speaks to, I mean, different different amped card groups, parks have different populations and have different like social connect connections and commitments, and so I think that really does speak to the fact that like the challenges are going to be different in different places, and you can't just push forward towards you know the next. Thing, like whether that's a barony or whether that's whatever without really considering what those challenges are and making sure that you're doing it the right way you know so I think it's really cool that you're kind of considering all of that yeah and we don't mind being a shire um, you know our one of our big goals is looking at trying to bring in those people of all ages I'm always reminding people and it was fun with the last parade getting to hand out little leaflets of who we are and stuff and I'd hand them to like kids that were really little to middle-aged people to even old people and reminding people that it was for all ages and something for everybody and it is and we still have I mean just from the way some of the other questions have gone there, we still have so much to learn like from you guys like there's no like the what the park is whether it's a shire or a barony it doesn't change that we all have our strengths and that you guys have so much to offer us in terms of just some of the creative things you do i'm still blown away by the way about the parade thing like that is such a brilliant way to demonstrate like amped guard in a way that's fun and exciting and like have everybody in costume like it just I'm still kind of stuck on that. I think that's incredible. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, and it's extra fun to get to like battle down the street. It's amazing how fast the parade can go. Um, and you know, we have some people that are don't like to fight, but they show up and they help out, and they are usually NPCs in quests and stuff. So in the parade, they dress up in awesome garb and hold the flags and banners and things like that. And, um, hand out flyers and candy and you find chocolate kisses are a great thing to do. It's just fantastic. <laughs> chocolate in general I, is a good thing to give out. I wish I could be there for the fourth this year, but like, I want to see all the pictures and next year that is definitely on my list of things to go see. Like, that's amazing. <laughs> Well, I guess backpedaling from some of the amp guard related questions, one of the one of the next ones we got from Delhi is tell me about all these natural slash healthy foods I've seen you post about. I eat a bunch of junk food all day, and and my not am I soon to not be young bodies on its last legs? Uh, right on. Um, well, it, it's kind of true. You are what you eat, and um, so you know uh, I'm a master herbalist. I went to the school of natural healing, uh, based down in Utah correspondence studies and stuff um, and so I've got a nutritionalist license and um, know a lot about how the, the body works and it's incredible all the information that we've gathered even in the last like 40 years about how the body works um, I've got a, a great book by a science team that actually connected connects the, um, the science between the food and how it affects our body and it's, this is kind of the first team that actually looks at that correlation on the foods and how we eat them and how we it, our bodies are affected by that. Um, and we're actually, through their scientific studies, we're able to um, generate a diet that helped heal a, an incredible amount of ailments. So many that they were constantly getting interrupted by calls because people had heard about it and so they'd call them and ask them about it. And so they, they didn't want to talk to people, they wanted to do their science stuff. And so they came out with this book um, to just kind of explain things. And so um, healthy food is just, it, it's really important. You know, the more you can get 
fresh vegetables and fruits into your diet you know it's got all those phytochemicals and calcium and vitamins and minerals you know the um, fiber and all of these things that your, your body needs and um, sometimes it seems like it might be a little more expensive but if it keeps you out of the doctor's office doesn't that mean it's kind of priceless I mean nobody wants to have to go to the doctors and the doctors don't want to be like overworked and having to, to, to deal with sick people it'd be awesome if everybody could just be healthy but people have to take that responsibility in their own hands and know that there's a cause and effect as to what we do on a daily basis and how it correlates with our health and so um uh you compare the price of produce to the price of health care it's a pretty obvious choice oh indeed and like i've heard that if you got a juicer um I know it's expensive to get a juicer and it might be expensive to get the fruits and vegetables to then juice, but if it keeps you out of the hospital for just one day, I mean, have you seen what it costs to have to stay in the hospital for one day and possibly all the different tests you might have to do or the different things? I mean, it's it, it definitely pays for itself. Um, sprouts are incredible. They say that there's more nutrition in a single sprout than in four pounds of cooked food. Um, I, I know a lot of stuff and I could talk for like hours and days about it and I, and I love talking about it um, but not everybody always wants to hear about it so uh, that's why I'm teaching my classes here in town and um, I finally found a good location down by Bishop, Bishop's Beach and I'll be teaching classes uh, all year um, another good one to try is uh, dates if you haven't tried dates have you guys tried dates before like the, the fresh Dates. Not since my last breakup. Like, oh. no, no, no! It's a, it's a fruit, and it's so delicious. People refer to it as nature's candy. But you don't want to get the dried dates. You know, it's like a dried out date, and you don't want to experience a dried out date. So get the fresh ones. They're juicy. They're moist. They're satisfying. I don't know. I, I, I feel like raisins and dates are why I have trust issues and don't like dates. <laughs> it's all those cookies and weird foods that are always cooked with them. I might try a fresh one though. I, I found that in my life I always like fresh fruit better than dried fruit. Like even the fruits that I like that are dried, I like the fresh ones the best. So and I don't think I've ever had a fresh date. Same. Well, and I have never liked any product that I've gotten with dates in them, but when I get these fresh dates, you can get, like, it's like $14 for a tub of them, but it's an incredible amount of dates. You can do all sorts of different projects and create all sorts of delicious things. And, um, and so it, it really equals out pretty good. Um, so, Arin, I actually have a, I have a small confession, actually. Oh, Yeah. So, for up until I was about 20, I actually didn't think Brussels sprouts were a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's better that way, Harz. They're no, awful. like, no, see, like... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, I've never actually seen them physically, because, you know, they were always, like, in the very back of, like, uh, our, co like our Costco's and grocery shops. So I would never actually, like, actively run into them. So I always thought, like, I saw them in cartoons, and I thought, maybe it's just a thing that parents made to scare their children into eating healthy. It is. It's also a thing parents used to torment their children when they don't want to eat other fruits and vegetables. Oh, you don't like those? Try these. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I should be fair. I So I am a firm believer that even when people think they don't like a thing, if they haven't tried all, like the way that thing is cooked this time, maybe or they haven't tried some new form of the thing, maybe they didn't, they just didn't like like one part of the thing, right? Because so many times in my life, I think I don't like things and then I'm surprised. So I grew up my whole life feeling like Brussels sprouts were awful. And then I had a friend fry them up with bacon and really the bacon can make everything better anyways, but they fried them up in a pan with bacon and then like baked them so they were crispy on the outside. And I realized it's not that I don't like Brussels sprouts. I just don't like Brussels sprouts the majority of the way they're cooked, like normally, but that one way they're actually really good. 
So Ray, I actually have a question. Did you come from like a super suburban family that would only just like uh, that would only just like microwave their, your vegetables or something? Because that's my main reason for not liking most of the ones I've had. Microwave vegetables are awful. Yeah, yeah. I don't like mushy vegetables, and the microwave will do it. it. So, but we didn't. We my mom just steamed everything all the time. She was from a family of pioneers up here, so like they were used to just eating older veggies and like just she steamed the cred out of everything <laughs> yeah see that that's the main reason i couldn't eat most of my vegetables it's just because they you know there were no there was no seasoning they weren't prepped with anything it's just it was just the vegetables as they were which i just i can't do it i just can't i actually as a kid learned to swallow brussels sprouts whole so i didn't have to chew them it doesn't make them better <laughs> okay so i just have like this image of you just as a small ray just trying to eat a brussels sprout and your jaw and your jaw just unhinges like a snake as you swallow it Precisely how I did it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, All of the story, fresh fruits and veggies are important. Go see Orion. <laughs> <laughs> right. Don't end up like Mars and Ray. And, you know, there's a multitude of cookbooks that I've come across that I haven't gotten to experiment with as much as I've, I'd like to, but I've gotten to eat at, um, at one establishment when I was doing my school training and got to eat vegan for a whole week and they had nachos and um, all sorts of different things that were absolutely delicious. I mean, eating healthy doesn't mean that you don't have to eat, eat good, you know. There's an incredible amount of spices and, and you're right, the, the slight change in spice or how you prepare or cook something can completely change the flavors and how it um, connects with your tongue and your taste buds and the whole experience so um, it just seems like healthy food has gotten this bad rap that like if you eat healthy then you're not gonna enjoy your food but I have read so many recipes and I've tried some like I made an incredible chocolate dip sauce out of avocados and dates and cocoa powder and it's absolutely delicious it's like a chocolate pudding I've actually heard that and been wanting to try it because at Costco you can get so I'm a huge fan of avocados I eat them always and like I like them without anything and I'm like I'll just eat them exactly as they are I feel like nature made them as perfect tiny little bowls of food like you can just cut them in half and you have your bowl right there so like avocados at Costco you can get these big tubs of like it says guacamole, it doesn't have anything else in it, it's just avocado. And it's actually fairly inexpensive. I've been wanting to get one of those and add dark cocoa powder because I saw a recipe similar to what you're talking about, except all you add is like sugar and cocoa powder and apparently it's like the best mousse anybody's ever had. But I'm like, do the avocados taste good with it? Like I just, but it sounds like they do. Uh, yeah, for sure. And what I would do is you could do sugar, um, but if you get into the dates and you, what you do is you soak them first, even the fresh dates, you take them and you soak them real good for like 15 minutes while you're getting everything else prepped and blended up Cuisinart. And um, you add the dates in because it's, they're very sweet. They're very sweet and chewy and awesome. And when you soak them, it, it helps um, make them disappear more into the, the pudding. And so you not only got to take the, the nut out of the middle but then you throw in the the fruit part of it and then you also add the water um, just a little bit at a time so you get it to the consistency that you want and um, the the avocado you don't taste it at all because it just disappears into it and the but the uh, consistency is just like silk smooth that's amazing now I want avocado date pudding <laughs> Right on. Yeah, it's oh, so good. I recommend strawberries or uh, apples or something like that. I mean, to dip in it. I'm just going to be dreaming of this for the whole rest of the episode. <laughs> well, maybe if we can like, maybe we can sort of snap us, ourselves back to reality with these last two questions here. So nope, avocados, hearts, avocados, <laughs> and dark. My favorite dessert is dark chocolate mousse. So basically, this idea just blended my two favorite things into one. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll try at least. So this next one we got from Delhi is, how do you run Quest in Ice Fire Bay logistically? What works well and what doesn't? 
Uh, well, you know, we've done a lot of, I guess, very flirty type quests, and each one we've learned a lot, and we find that it's it's really helpful. Um, we don't do it the day of the quest, but that next week we try to meet as a group, as the you know, the the top four, and talk about what worked well, and and the person that helped create the quest, and you know, we just talk about what worked well and what didn't, and what we can change for next time. Because um, we've had some props set up and stuff that people found early, and I mean, we're always encouraging our questers to communicate with each other because one could learn a clue, and then you know another could learn another clue, and if they talk to each other about it, then they might actually figure out what's going on. You know, because um, we like to leave lots of clues and um, a lot of different possibilities. We definitely encourage the role playing and um, using creative ideas and. And things like that. I mean, to the point where we did have a quest one time where um, uh, there was only a couple of people that showed up, um, but none of them were working together, and they were just fighting amongst each other and weren't figuring anything out. And so that's when the dragon took over the Shire, and we all became peasants for a month. So all the battle games that we met for, we were all peasant class, and um, we. Um, had to have a couple more quests where we then worked together and defeated the the dragon and earned our right to clasp i and i think i was there for that one <laughs> i think i remember that all right i thought yeah, you had I was about to say, this is starting to sound a little familiar yes I think is, came up for the epic conclusion this opens the door to like really awesome possibilities in terms of tying quest results into future battle games and vice versa like that, like that's a really cool way to do it. Where there was like there were real consequences to not, you know, defeating the dragon or whatever. Well, yeah, it seems to to make it a little bit more fun to know that. I mean, like really, if they're they're gonna be like that, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people play D and D. It, it's like the players messing with the DM and being like, no, we're not gonna do what we're supposed to. Like, okay, well now you get to deal with the consequences. There you go. Retribution's um, a bitch. That's right, but it can also be fun and um, a learning experience. I'm moving to Homer, guys. All right, we I guess it's the end of the hunt. show then. <laughs> I'm, I'm no, I can still, I can still help. <laughs> I'm not moving <laughs> right now. It's gonna be later. <laughs> I have to get my MD first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right on. we'd be happy to have you. I can attest for Ray. She's a great page. Goodbye forever, Harz. <laughs> Ribbon pepperonis, Ray. Um, that... uh, well, another thing that really helps out with our questings and stuff is uh, we try to hold a couple ANS themed events. I mean, people are always welcome to work on their own project, but we we bring supplies and materials for like um, like we take cardboard boxes, sturdy ones like shoe boxes and things like that and a bunch of brown paint and different like things so people can paint boxes and you know uh, pretty them up to make them look like treasure chests and then it's just like kind of more authentic gets people in the mood a little bit more things like that um, another thing that works really well is you know we usually have NPCs walking around trying to help kind of nudge the questers towards different things or have have clues if the questers choose to engage with them but um, sometimes we have NPCs that will hand out curses and blessings to just kind of mix things up a little bit. And so that can be very fun, especially if, you know, they try to hand you one paper that has something on it and you say no, well, then they're going to hand you another one and you have to take it. So um, we've had a lot of fun with that. And so that's been a modification that we did because there were people that were refusing to take them. And, well, that's not part of the game. Uh, you better take the first one because the second one is going to be bad probably either way. I mean, I can't argue with that. First roll, don't argue with the DM. That's right, and everybody has fun. Well, I mean, I guess I guess that kind of answered the other question that Deli had about like asking you to tell him about some of your favorite quest moments, because uh, I think we went over quite a bit of that. Well, what are some other ones, though? I need to hear more about my future home. <laughs> <laughs> I really well, love this quest format. Like, this is brilliant. 
Oh, you know, actually, our last uh, camping questing adventure was really fun. We did it up at the uh, Agaya Center. Um, we probably won't do it there again because it was it was very remote and just not exactly what we were looking for. There's other places that would work better, I suppose. Um, but we had a lot of fun up there, and um, the Shire worked really hard uh, many uh, the two months beforehand, uh, making stuff and putting it in the freezer so it could be cooked up easy. Um, making various um, questing items and different things like that, costumes for the monsters and everything, and everybody set up tents. Um, we had quite a few different like questing moments and stuff. We had a couple of different uh, tournaments. We did the a regular tournament, and then we did a wizard tournament, and um, it, it was a whole lot of fun. It, it really pushed a lot of Shire members to to a higher potential I mean just like I saw some great things come out of various members and as they rose to different challenges that came across but um that was definitely one of our, our most favorite times and uh we want to do another one but um this summer has just been kind of busy and we need to recruit more people that can can really help out with the event I'm kind of curious, as sort of a resident Paragon wizard, or at least one of them, how did the whole wizard tournament thing, and what did that whole thing entail? Well, actually, our resident wizard, Harkin, um, who's a high schooler here, uh, came up with the wizarding tournament and um, ran it through Chi, the, the specifics and everything, and ran the whole tournament. While he was doing the tournament, I was prepping and uh, preparing other parts of the quest, getting the next section of the quest going, you know, while people were enjoying that. I only got to catch little snippets of it and um, didn't quite understand the whole lot, but it's all about delegating, right? Huh, I guess I'll have to ask her next time I go there. Yeah, or come for our next camping adventure, because it was very successful and everybody had a lot of fun with it. And I think it really opened up the wizard class to a lot of new people that may have not tried it uh, previous. And so it also inspired some of our Shire members to maybe uh, do a bard competition or assass assassin competition or whatnot. Not not an assassin competition like Wolf's Cry, it would be sort of like, like the wizarding tournament or, or whatnot. I have to say, I so when I I promise this ties back in. When I first had heard about LARP and I was interested in it, I was down in Seattle, and I didn't know where to go. And I had a friend of a friend who LARPed regularly, and they had to pay weekly fees to LARP, or not maybe not weekly, but they paid a fee every time they went. And most of the time, I think. One of the groups that I was informed about met once a month and you paid like a 20 to $50 fee or something like that. And then it was this whole, it was a camping event where, and it was set in like this zombie themed apocalypse or something, but with elves and magic and all of that. But the idea was like, I guess people could be raided at night. Like you weren't safe when you were in the actual active grounds. Like you could choose to camp in the actual active grounds. And you weren't safe the entire duration that you were there because it was all like you were immersed in it. And I'm not sure how they did it practically, but I always thought that that was fascinating and interesting. Um, and how, like, what the implications for something like that would be for Amtgard to do something similar where maybe you have a safe place to sleep where people could be like, okay, time out while I sleep at night or whatever. But then you had like an ongoing quest area where it was just ongoing from the time you arrive until you know breakdown on whatever day like I always wondered kind of how that worked because I never did get out there the the fee was a bit much while I was in college oh sure I could see that being a whole lot of fun I mean it all depends on where you want to set up your tent and if you you really get tired and, and need that rest you can just pull up your stakes and slide your tent over to the the safe zone you know that yeah. way you don't have to fully participate, but you can in some stuff. That's a wonderful idea because, you know, it's it's neat to have that idea that you could be woken up in the middle of the night or something like that. Never know what to expect. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that wouldn't be for everybody. There are some people that don't like being waken up, woken up. There are all different factors involved, but... I always wondered how they worked that aside from having like safe zones and non-safe zones like what the actual like 
logistics of running that work. <laughs> well, I imagine you have to have some volunteers willing to rouse things up in the middle of the night, but also have some pretty neat possibilities. Like maybe they could end up going on a treasure hunt in the middle of the night if they took that possibility. But, um, you know, have a, a roped off section so that those people that wanted to be inactive, they could just, you know, that way the, the player, the people that were engaging them, the NPCs and stuff would know who, who still wants to keep playing and who wants to take a break. Oh, it would be super funny if you tie that back into everything else. Like, <laughs> you have someone going around, hey, hey, now's the only time we have to go. And <clears throat> you have some kind of special award. And then maybe some of the people in the active zone still don't wake up. Well, they get left. <laughs> the next morning, they're like, oh, no, I slept through the adventure. <laughs> I slept too long. That sounds awesome. Like if Frodo like, just forgot to wake up and slept in one day when they were trying to go to Mordor. <laughs> they missed the eagles. Aw, shucks. <laughs> well, now we're walking. Well, that explains so much about those movies. <laughs> Maybe he did oversleep. It, it could have been such a shorter movie. But, but they had to get that toil across. So, you know, might as well stretch it. Uh, as a side note, I love those movies. And if you haven't seen the extended version, then you're missing out. Those movies total. When you watch the extended version and you go from start to finish. And do you include The Hobbit in it when you do it? Like, and if you did, how long would it be? Uh, I'd say really long and maybe take a week to make it through. I mean, at least for me. Ars, do you know? Do I need to look this up? <laughs> sorry, sorry, I was away for a second. What did I miss? How long, if you were to put maybe, okay, the extended edition of Lord of the Rings from start to finish versus maybe like everything, The Hobbit all the way through, how long would that playtime be? Wait, are we talking both the unextended, the extended Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit or just one or the other? Both. Like, but one and then one and the other. Okay, one second. Yeah, I'm going to so map that. that out really quick. <laughs> there are really great movies. Although I have to say I grew up on The Hobbit. My grandpa used to read that to me as a bedtime story instead of kids' books. And so I have this deep love for Bilbo. Like, Bilbo, when I think of superheroes or I think of hero characters, Bilbo is the template I go by because he was just a normal dude that got scared, but like faced down his fears and did what needed to be done every single time. Like he always did the right thing. Like even even when he struggled with it and he, he just stayed true. Like, and I love the heck out of Bilbo. So Frodo really, I just never cared for Frodo much because I loved Bilbo so much. And that's how I see a hero should be like from the time I was a small child and on. Uh, me too, but I guess uh, we had the, the movie, so I watched that one quite a few times. Was that the Bakshi one? The what? The Bakshi one, the animated one? Yeah, that one. Uh, it was it was really good. I still think Bilbo's depicted better in the books than he was in the animated movie. However, he was still good. He was still a good hero in the animated movie. And in the live action, I feel like they really nailed him, like with their choice of actors and also just with him in general. Like they got him down. I loved it. All else aside, Bilbo and Gollum were the two like ones I needed to be spot on and, and Smog, I guess. So three. And those are the three they nailed. And so I love them. Okay, so I, I did the math, by the way. So the total for all th all six movies is 19 hours and 39 minutes. We can do this. We just need a few energy drinks. <laughs> yeah, it's like I say, Mama made you didn't raise a quitter. All right, sounds like fun. Let's do it. It, it can be like Mystery Science Theater, except it's like Northreach Science F Theater, and then we can all be on Mumble commenting as we watch the whole series from start to finish. <laughs> okay, okay, so I walked away for a second to move some stuff, and I I missed a whole talk about doing a riff track, because I am 100% behind this. <laughs> yeah, that awesome idea. As you were saying it, I was getting the same idea. Hey, 
It's amazing what you can do with Mumble, right? Like, okay, so like... I was doing the math, by the way, and, uh... <clears throat> so the time it would spend on the individual ones would be... For the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, it would be 11 hours and 32 minutes. And for The Hobbit, that would be... Wow, The Hobbit's a lot shorter than I was expecting it to be. 8 hours and... 8 hours and 10 minutes. I feel like this is a thing we should do at the end of summer. We should plan, like, two days where we can just sit down and, like, go through the movies, like, marathon them with all our favorite snack foods and drinks because we could compare what they're doing to LARP like, how would this work in LARP? Like, what, you know, what's going on with this? And then we could also, like, Frodo is a goldmine of, like, heckling. Like, I love Elijah Wood. I was so excited when he was playing Frodo because he was one of my first childhood crushes. And uh, I think it was, like, Tom Sawyer or Huckleberry Finn or something like that. I, like, I first saw him. I'm like, that other kid that's my age is beautiful. And he's such a cool character. Anyways, but I was so disappointed in Frodo. I, I guess I never, in the actual book series, I never realized, like, just how truly, like, kind of whiny he was see, <laughs> as a character. See, I think you still had a better introduction to to Haley Joel... Or not Haley... Yeah, ha wait, no. I was gonna say Haley Joel Osmond. Elijah Wood. Elijah Wood. Okay, never mind. I got the two mixed up, so I know I'd say we we both got good introductions to him at least. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to be introduced to him, Lord of the Rings is probably better. In Sin City, he was a little bit scary. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say because that's the only other movie I could think of that I saw him in. Yeah, I remember seeing him in a handful. I just none of them are coming to mind right now. Huckleberry Finn, I think, was the one where, like, he was just normal. He's not. A hobbit. He's not a weird black and white serial killer. He's just kind of a normal actor as a kid. He's a little bit snotty because he's a kid, but he gets over it. So, Ray, I'm gonna put you on a pedestal here, and I'm just gonna say I I, I wholeheartedly appreciate you being a co-host and able to carry on like a conversation when I'm not around. Because like I ended up getting called because I had to move some some boxes because I'm in the process of moving right now. And I had to step away from like a couple minutes and I come back and I see you guys are still talking about something. I apparently missed on half the conversation, but yeah, I, Listen, I appreciate you for that, Ray. I have a very specific set of skills, small in number. One of them is talking. <laughs> Hey, I appreciate someone who knows how to, who knows how to who put all their points on the charisma based che checks. I still need to work on asking more questions. Is it is it time? Do I get to ask more questions? Well, I mean, we kind of we went through all of our all of our main questions pretty much. So, uh, but yeah, if you have anything else, then by all means. This is actually my favorite part because so I like waiting to see all the questions that come up when people ask before I ask questions because. A lot of times there are things like I want to ask follow up questions or I'm curious about other things or I get to see like did somebody ask a question I already would have asked right so I can kind of fill in the pieces but my favorite question to ask people and I've been trying consistently if nobody else asks to ask this question is how did you get into AmpGuard to begin with like what like who brought you or did you find it on your own or did you like just what was it that brought you to AmpGuard? And then what was it that kept you? Like, what was what was it about AmpGuard that really just drew you in and you're like, no, this is the organization I'm going to choose because we all have a finite amount of time. Like I know I was looking for volunteer opportunities and a community that I wanted to volunteer with for probably a good couple of years when I came back to Alaska and then I found Northreach and I was like, this is an amazing cause. Like, it just, there's such a huge diverse community here. And I feel like it's so good to bring physical activity and the arts and the sciences all into like one arena and really promote all of it and leadership. And in the way that it does it, I'm just always impressed with leadership in AmpGuard. So I'm curious, like being from Homer and like what brought you into AmpGuard and what kept you? 
Well, I mean, uh, I mentioned earlier, I saw the, the newspaper ad and then three other people told me about it and stuff. And so I went up there uh, with my kid and um, her and her cousin went, uh, them and their cousin went up and checked it out and stuff. And uh, I was hanging out in the park and they came back down and they're like, um, well, you got to come and do it with us. And I was like, well, all right. And so I went up there and I, you know, it probably been a long time since I'd ran but um, you know with us being a, a young Shire I was one of the tallest people there so they went ahead and made me a, a zombie uh, warlord right away and so like I knew <laughs> nothing about it I didn't know his locations or anything I hadn't swung a sword or anything like that and I ran my my butt off for three hours and I was I figured I'd be gone for like an hour it was three hours and we had a blast and I went running screaming at people and I found that to be very effective even though I, I knew nothing about how to use the swords and I kind of figured out little bits so along the way and uh, we had some people visiting down that I think I feel like had a lot of patience for me considering I, I was also trying to embody that persona of, of being a zombie and just also being a little confused about what the rules were and what different things meant and all of that stuff um, but we had such a blast with it and um, I've always been interested in, in fantasy stuff you know my, my whole life I've read a lot of fantasy novels and stories and uh, I always wanted to get into D&D &D, but could never quite get a, a group together they seemed to create a lot of characters and then it was always time to go um, but uh and so when this came about it's like I've, i always also when i was a teenager i really wanted to uh spar and fight with people but um nobody would fight with me because i had a lot of guy friends and they didn't want to hit a girl i guess or something like that and so like i love that i get to go out on the field and wield my weapons and people are all about attacking me it doesn't matter that i'm a girl and um, so I enjoy wielding my staff and um, getting killed over and over again and learning new techniques and different skills. Um, I look forward to uh, holding more battle practices because um, we have some people that can teach some. It's just coordinating times and getting people to show up and things like that. But um, so when I got to do this, it was just like everything that I always really wanted to do for the longest time. And then here it was. And um, Samantha Cunningham was running it. And I would known her in town here for many years and would have lo always loved to have uh, a reason or be able to, to hang out with her a bit, bit more. And so it was awesome that she was so involved with this. And um, uh, I think we... we do really well together and so it's been really fun getting to work with her on different projects and with battle games and we give those kids a run for their money i mean they give us a run for our money too but i mean it's just a lot of fun and i'm really happy to be here and i yeah it's good stuff so thank you guys for establishing this in in alaska and being such a part of it well hey thank you for doing this because honestly we're only as we're only as good as the sum of our parts so you were saying that you got into Amped Guard, though, because you were playing with your kids and they made you a zombie warlord? <laughs> yeah, for my very first quest, of my very first ever being a part of it. And so I got to, to run and I had the zombie abilities and, um, you know, it was it was really interesting and inventive and it was just everything I always wanted to do. That is so amazing. <laughs> and then as I found out about ANS, I, I got even more excited and, you know, the different like events and how there are people up the road and all the different things like that. It just was amazing how it unfolded into so many different facets. So I guess off of that question, what is what is your favorite part of like of all those different facets? I think most of us who play like, I totally get what you mean when you talk about there's so many different facets to Amped Guard, like, and that's one of the things I really love about it. Um, like, for me, I really, I really enjoy doing the fundraising stuff, like, because I feel like that helps support Amped Guard so that it can continue in our communities. And I also like interacting with 
the public and people who maybe don't know what it is because I feel like there are so many people that would love it and just don't know enough about what it is like and even just talking about it isn't the same as like getting out and experiencing it so like but I have friends that what draws them in is building armor and crafting things and some people it's the sparring and the fighting like for you what is the number one thing when you think of Amped Guard that you just always get excited to do and you always look forward to Oh, that would be the questing, whether it's running a quest or playing in a quest. It's just so exciting, all of the, the different areas and getting to either put on this elaborate story or try to problem solve and work through the story and whatnot. I really do have to get down there for one of your quests. <laughs> Sounds like so much fun. It, it, it really is, for sure. And I think it would help when we have our quest to, to maybe put that in the, the newspaper so that because um, we can list uh, events, what's happening that day, um, and it gets printed in the newspaper to have that, that exposure and to be sure to share it on a couple of Facebook pages and just really invite people out to feel free to walk through and check it out or that we do have the war chest and um, <clears throat> that they're welcome to join in if they want. That's something that I... I think I've probably mentioned this once or twice, but got me when I first started seeing everybody play was I was at a barbecue for something else. And the number one reason I didn't immediately go over and ask to play is I wasn't sure if it was a closed group or not. That's something that it, I think it's really important for all of us to remember that, I mean, the first assumption when you see a group of people doing a sport or doing crafting sessions or whatever, the only people that are going to come over and talk to us and ask about it are probably going to be the most extroverted people that are curious. Um, and that a lot of, and I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty introverted, but I'm not shy at all, but a lot of people are going to default to, Oh, that's a closed activity. Like that's, they all know each other or they're all friends because we're all familiar with, you know, various members in the group. Um, and so there are a lot of people that will just watch but won't necessarily come over and ask to play, but they would love to if they knew that it was open and they knew that everybody could come over. So finding ways to overcome that hurdle, like you were saying the news article, like is brilliant. Like that's such a great idea. Well, and really with mentioning all the people, you know, noticing it and stuff, that inspires the idea of having like those two signs on like a wooden stake that you can just, you know, pound into the ground. At, at an outdoor battle games or whatnot, one saying, come join us, and another one kind of giving a brief description of, of what we are and what we do, you know, and maybe, you know, have uh, have it list a, a person that's very easily described that they can go to and talk to for more information about it. Yeah, like a point of contact. Yeah, for sure. Well, that for sure sums up my questions. I really, really enjoyed talking to you about this and getting your input and experiences. This is super cool. Thank you. <laughs> this has been a good episode, yeah. I, I realize I'm sounding like a broken record for, for saying that, but we've been getting some good episodes these last couple times. Yeah, they. I, I just really love everybody in Ant Garden. I just, I want that said. And every, I'm excited because, like, I haven't gotten to speak with you much before, like, just in our interactions at Wolf's Cry and whatnot. But, like, this is the whole... Amped Guard experience. I always find that I just love Amped Guarders. You're all amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's probably a good point to stop at. So I would like to make a personal thank you to everybody who's been watching up to this point. And Arian, thank you for being on our show. This has been a blast. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. I've really enjoyed talking with you and getting to hear stories and share ideas. This has been great. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you all for watching and tune in next next time where we'll be doing a special episode with the two candidates that are competing for the title of King of the North. Until then, I'll see you guys in the next episode. I'm Harz, this is Ray, and you've been watching The Chopping Block. Have a good night, everybody. Goodbye. I'm going to Homer. Mm -hmm.